five-minute medicine series on diabetic ketoacidosis. DKA is one of the most serious complications in diabetes. It is at the extreme end of the hyperglycemic spectrum, characterized by hyperosmolality, hyperglycemia, and ketoacidosis. This is more common in type 1 diabetics, although type 2 diabetics can develop DKA as well. It can be the initial presentation of previously undiagnosed diabetes. Oftentimes, patients have stopped or decreased their insulin use when the exact opposite is indicated. DKA occurs during an insulin deficient state. Infections are by far the most common cause of DKA, although any stress on the body can be a potential precipitant. If DKA is part of your differential, your history should target the characteristics of DKA. It lists the symptoms of hyperglycemia and hyperosmolality such as polyuria, polydipsia, lethargy, confusion, and dizziness. Inquire about their insulin usage and dose. It lists the symptoms of acidosis such as nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. It's very important to be aware that something caused the DKA and to investigate possible causes in your history. On a physical exam, check the vital signs and fluid status of the patient. Check the mental and respiratory status, as well as anything that may help you find the cause of the precipitant. Let the history guide you. Initial evaluations include a CBC for a possible elevated white count, electrolytes for derangements, creatinine for renal function, plasma osmolality, serum ketones, and urinalysis for ketones and possible UTI. A ABG for a degree of acidosis, and ECG for a possible acute MI. As always, do what is necessary to find the cause of the precipitant, including a toxicology screen if warranted. Diagnosis consists of findings of hyperglycemia and an increased ion gap acidosis due to keto acids. Multiple issues need to be attended to simultaneously in DKA, but we will go through each one separately. Patients are intravascularly depleted 3 to 6 liters. Give crystalloid like normosaline for initial fluid resuscitation, and it can be continued unless the patient's hypernatremic. Dextrose-containing solutions will eventually be needed to maintain blood glucose levels as the patient produces urine and insulin does its work. Give the fluids as quickly as possible given the patient's clinical picture and cardiac status. It's important to correct electrolyte derangements early, and potassium is the most important one to check. Often, there is a marked total body potassium depletion, but serum potassium is usually normal. Ensure that the patient is voiding before potassium replacement. Supplement potassium to half normal saline as potassium chloride is osmotically active. Maintain serum potassium levels between 4 and 5 millimolar. Keto acids produce an increased anion gap acidosis. Insulin deficiency and glucagon excess promotes ketogenesis from products of lipolysis. Giving insulin inhibits lipolysis metabolizes ketones and generates bicarbonate. Therefore, its main role is to correct the acidosis, although it obviously reduces blood sugar levels as well. Follow the effects of insulin through the anion gap. Correct severe hypokalemia, levels that are below 3.3 millimolar, before starting insulin. Otherwise, you can start insulin treatment along with fluid and electrolyte replacement simultaneously, as described previously. Start with regular insulin infusion. Blood glucose will respond quicker than anion gap, and you may need to titrate up the insulin infusion to lower the anion gap even when the blood glucose is at an acceptable level. Dextrose containing solutions, as mentioned, is needed to maintain blood glucose as insulin must not be stopped. Increase uh, the dextrose solutions in order to continue insulin at minimum levels. The following is the criteria to switching to sub-Q insulin. It's important to always have insulin on board or the patient will slip back in DKA. Ensure the anion gap is closed and the patient is eating. A steady state insulin rate of less than 2 units per hour is recommended, otherwise a large sub dose may be needed. To treat hyperglycemia, it's important to realize that glucosuria initially minimizes hyperglycemia until volume depletion and reduction GFR occurs. Glute resuscitation alone is a powerful tool to reduce blood sugar levels even when insulin is not given. DKA patients require close monitoring. Blood glucose checks every hour and electrolytes and VBGs every two hours are recommended initially. Ensure dextrose is in IV solutions when appropriate and to replace potassium. Switch to sub-Q insulin when appropriate, as in the previous slide. You may have noticed a recurring theme in this presentation, and that is to find and treat the precipitant to properly treat the DKA. Call the SMR whenever the ABCs are not secure, such as when the patient's hypotensive. Also notify the SMR when the 
patient exhibits altered mental status or whenever you are unsure about management. In summary, DK consists of multiple metabolic derangements. Metabolic acidosis is corrected by the administration of insulin. Renal excretion of glucose is the main driver for decreasing high plasma glucose levels. Correct severe potassium deficiencies before starting insulin. Always treat the precipitating event. Please see the Canadian Diabetes Associated Guidelines.